I'm Heather Digby, I'm one of the deacons, and I'd like to welcome you here um, this Palm Sunday. I'm going to start with a reading from Matthew, chapter 21, and let me know if the mic starts working and I'll stop shouting. <laughs> but I've got my teacher voice, so I think you should be able to hear me. I hear you. But if the mic starts working, it'll be really bad. There we go. There we go. All right, Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage of the Mount of Olives, Bethphage, sorry, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Then the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us together this morning. As we get ready for Holy Week, we remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. However, as we look to the cross, may we be reminded of the empty tomb and the victory we have over death through Jesus Christ. Bless our time together and help us to be focused and celebrate with fellow Christians. Amen. Psalm 118, verses 26 through 29, and we're going to do that response, or sorry, uh, in unison, so please rise if you are able. Blessed is he who comes in, in the, the name, name of the Lord. Lord. From, From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord, the Lord is God, and, and he has made his light shine on us. With, with bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. 
You are, you are my God, God and I will exalt you. you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. The word Hosanna that the crowds were shouting as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the last, the first day of the last week of his life before the cross. That word Hosanna means Lord save. Lord save. And so um, we're going to sing a song called Hosanna now.
Lord, we, we confess that we are a people who need saving. Uh, we need saving from our sins. We need saving from the perils of this world. And thank you that you are saving us as we trust in you. Amen. This is called When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Let's sing together. When I survey the
You can remain standing as we sing the doxology and receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, today and this week we come and remember how you Lord Jesus gave everything for us. And so it's our joy, it's our privilege to surrender back what we have to you. We pray that these offerings would be tokens of our love and that they would be seeds planted to grow fruit in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, we have some announcements, which we usually start with birthdays and anniversaries. Okay, on the birthday today, I have my birthday today. Bork Webb, as you said, is Bork here today? Bork is here. What? <laughs> Anybody else that's got birthdays or anniversaries? Oh, well, we have to sing. Okay. Happy birthday! If you're from three years old to second grade for a children's activity downstairs. And thank you to the adult helpers and the, the teen helpers today as well. Um, take a look in your bulletin at this schedule here, which lays out the, the plan for Holy Week. There's something going on every day this week except Saturday until kind of leading up to Easter Sunday. So um, please avail yourselves of some of these opportunities to worship, to pray, to focus on Jesus um, as we look toward the, toward the empty tomb, as Heather reminded us. I always find that um, the more I meditate on Christ's sufferings and on the events of Holy Week, the more ready I am to celebrate the resurrection. And so, you know, maybe, maybe God wants to take you on a journey this year through Holy Week. And I'd invite you, I'd urge you to respond to his invitation. Um, what else? I want to welcome you today. If you're visiting, it's great to have you with us. We love having visitors here. And does anyone else have an announcement this morning? I don't want to cruise over anything. Wow, that's, that might be a first. Okay. Well, then we, uh, we get to do one of the most important things of our service today, which is pray. So please bow your heads and pray with me. And I will uh, invite you to lift up names and requests as we as we go Jesus uh, we believe that you are here and you are real and you have power to save you have power to forgive sin power to heal power to restore what is broken power to give us hope if we're hopeless power to uh, show us love that we have never known before. And so we open ourselves to you now. Lord, by the work of your Holy Spirit, would you, would you do what you do so well among us today? Would you heal wounds, reconcile enemies, 
Help us to make peace with you and with ourselves. Would you give us strength to face the day and face the week and the challenges that we deal with and the things that we'll wake up to tomorrow morning with work and with school and with all the routines in our lives. Lord, we want to, we want to know you and to know your power and your grace in our daily lives. So teach us to do that. And we lift up to you friends and family and others um, with, with the same basic request that you would show yourself to them, bless them, make your face shine on them, whether it's uh, physical illness they're dealing with or uh, grief or some other problem. Uh, I just invite you to lift up the name of someone that you want to bring to Jesus today. Tina. Dylan. Linda St. Peter. Gail Carson. Sue Kramer. Savannah and Sophie. Barry's neighbor. Doreen. Lynn and Carolyn. Patrick's grandmother and Michelle. Lord, you know exactly what to do with each of these people. We, we don't know how to help them, but you do. Um, actually, that's not quite true. We, you've given us gifts to bless and to serve, and so I pray that uh, we would do what we can to show your love and, and care for people around us, and you would do what we cannot to, um, uh, to restore and to heal and to save, to put back what is broken. Lord, we think of um, uh, the, the teenager, Rebecca Ball, who has been missing uh, from Middlebury for a few days, and we pray that you would let her be found and restored, brought back to her family. Let her be safe. We pray, Lord, for those affected um, in the Midwest and the South by the storms that swept through on Friday and just the many that are without a home now or the people who've even lost um, loved ones. And um, we pray for them. We pray for your help and your care and your provision and for your people to be on the ground supporting and helping we pray for, Lord, our community and our churches in this area, um, especially as we um, go through this Holy Week. We ask for just a revival of, um, uh, of your work in this area. Would you turn hearts back to you? Would you help people understand who Jesus is? Would you bring unity and love in our church and in the churches here? Would you uh, make Jesus non-ignorable in Franklin County? And uh, would you just send your people, um, the people who know and love you, to do your work uh, all around us? Lord, the world is so desperate for, for your kingdom to come and for your work to happen. And we long to see the fruit of that right here in our own backyards. So we ask you to move. And let's pray now the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Feel free to pray if you know this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. What a beautiful morning. The scripture today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31, and that can be found in uh, page 924 in the Pew Bibles. Christ crucified is God's power and wisdom. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the whole the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Thank you, Eleanor. Okay, we are going to make sense of what was just read, I promise you. And if I don't, then come talk to me after the service. <laughs> Do you know what an oxymoron is? It's a, a phrase where two words are put together that seem to have opposite meanings. Here are some of my favorites. Minor crisis. Icy hot. Open secret. Pretty ugly. True lies. You know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Original copy. Definite maybe. Fresh frozen. Amtrak schedule. <laughs> if you've ever ridden on Amtrak, you know why that's an oxymoron. Virtual reality. And last but not least, jumbo shrimp. <laughs> Did you know that in God's wisdom, there is an oxymoron smack dab at the heart of the Christian message? That oxymoron is this. Jesus is the crucified Messiah. The crucified Messiah. Because Messiah means something like, well, it means anointed one. Think like the chosen one or the Savior. And crucified means someone who is executed on a cross. Those two concepts did not go together when the gospel first went out. And it's a little ironic that today the cross has become this symbol, this sort of nice religious symbol that we wear around our necks or put on a tattoo on our arms or on our truck, you know, to be, you know, to help us, you know, be centered or some people use it as a good luck charm. But in Jesus' day, the cross was anything but a religious symbol. It was the ultimate symbol of humiliation, failure, and pain, and death. And no one could imagine how Messiah and crucified could be in the same sentence. 
let alone be the message that was preached about Jesus. We forget how upside down the message of the cross is. You know, something similar in American history might be like a rope used for a lynching. Can you imagine if people wore necklaces with little gold hangman's nooses on them? Or if we sang songs about our lynched Lord? That's what it sounded like when people were preaching the crucified Messiah. It's like, what, what are these people smoking? Crucified Messiah? That doesn't make sense. Now, the people that the Apostle Paul was writing to in this letter of, called 1 Corinthians... They had forgotten how central that message was of the crucified Messiah. Uh, they were a church where people prided themselves on being wise and spiritual and kind of one-upping each other on their religious experiences. And uh, people flocked to articulate, dazzling speakers. But Paul says, never forget that the only thing we have to offer people is a message that sounds foolish to the world. The message of the crucified Messiah. That's a message that nobody starting, trying to start a religion would ever make up. It sounds insane, but this is exactly how God wants it. Because it does two things. It disgusts the proud and it delights the humble. That's what the gospel does. This message of the crucified Messiah, some people turn their noses up at it and say, oh, I, that can't be true. And the people who get it say, God, you are so amazing. I never could have imagined how you, saved, how you would save us. Look at verse 18. And if you don't have your Bibles open, I'd, I'd urge you to do so. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So we need to listen to what God is saying to us today through this Holy Scripture and ask two questions. Why does the message of the cross seem foolish to some? And how can we be people who know its power? Let's pause to pray before we launch in. Lord, we need you to be our teacher. I know that the words I've written are, um, are nothing unless you breathe your power into them. And I pray that they would only illuminate the truth that is already here that you would be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. So number one, why does the cross seem foolish to some people? Well, it flies in the face of human wisdom. And that's exactly how God wanted it to be. Look at verse 19. Paul quotes the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years earlier where God had said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. I like how Eugene Peterson, who paraphrased this in the Message Bible, puts it. He says, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as shams. No religious expert predicted a crucified Messiah. No philosopher reasoned his way to that conclusion. And here's why. Jews in Jesus' day were living under Roman occupation and they were waiting for their Messiah to come charging in on a white stallion and conquer the Romans and drive them out and establish the kingdom of God on earth where, the, where Israel would once again have power and have prestige and have safety. That's what they were thinking of with Messiah, power, nobility, strength. Now put that together with crucified. Crucifixion was the cruelest, most inhumane, most stomach-turning death sentence possible. And the Romans perfected it to be that way. 
The victim would first be flogged with a lead-tipped whip, opening up gashes all over their back and their body. And then his arms would be stretched out on a beam and nails driven through the wrists. The beam was put on an upright post where the victim's feet would be nailed to the post. And so they're, they're up there, all of their weight pulling against the most painful parts of their body. Sometimes they would take days to die in the heat, in the sun, thirsty, helpless, covered in blood. It was the most painful way people had come up with to kill someone. Now, aren't there... um, Why why go to all that trouble to execute someone? (laughs) Surely there are lots of easier ways to do it, you know? The whole point was that it was the most shaming, humiliating death possible. It sent a message. It was the ultimate symbol of defeat. And the Romans reserved the right. They were the only ones in their empire allowed to crucify. I mean, other groups couldn't do it. Only they could do it. And it was only for the worst criminals and for enemies of the state. So here's a famous example. Uh, Several generations before Christ. Have you heard of Spartacus? He was a slave that led a revolt where like 100,000 slaves rose up and tried to be free. Well, it took a long time for the Romans to crush this revolt. When they finally did, the general who defeated them took 6,000 of those defeated slaves and crucified them for 120 miles along the road in and out of Rome. Imagine driving from here to Glens Falls, New York, and every hundred feet seeing someone on a cross, covered in blood, flies circling, crows pecking, in various states of death and life. That sent the message, this is what happens when you mess with the power of Rome. You are nothing. You are human garbage. That's what the cross meant. So when people were preaching, our Messiah has come and he's been crucified. There was confusion. There was, there was shock. It sounded foolish. It was an oxymoron. You know, Jesus, not only did he die, not only did he not overthrow the Romans, he was killed by them. He didn't go out in a blaze of glory He went out in shame and humiliation. What kind of Messiah would do that? It didn't fit with what anyone expected. And that's exactly how God wanted it. The other day I was listening to a memoir by a woman named Beth Moore, who's a well-known Bible teacher. And she said something that made me reach for my phone and pause and have to write this down. She said, God appears to be robustly committed to disproving human formulas. That's what the cross does. Paul goes on in verse 20, Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? The world's wisdom, both religious and secular, says that we can figure things out. We can uh, reason our way to God, or we can do religious things to make ourselves right with God. Uh, We can use money or status or whatever to rise up and to, to achieve what we need. And the cross shows that all of that conventional wisdom is garbage. It's bankrupt. We can't do anything to figure out God and how to get to know him and how to be saved. God says, you can't get to me with reason or with your status or with your uh, wisdom. You need radical divine intervention. You need the blood of my son to forgive your sin. And it's almost as if God delighted, delighted in doing that in a way that no one ever expected or predicted, so no one could say, yeah, 
I had that figured out. <laughs> I knew that's how God was going to do it. You know, this is still true today. The experts, the pundits, the best-selling authors, the people that we look to for wisdom and, and great teaching in this world, those that draw the biggest crowds do not have room for a crucified Messiah in their message. Anything but. There's how to make money, how to manifest your dreams, how to be successful, how to, um, how to commune with the divine, how to be a good person. Crucified Messiah? No. Because it's foolish. It's offensive. Listen to what Paul says in verse 20, verses 22 to 24. Jews demand signs. Okay, Jews were very religious, and they wanted God to show up in a supernatural sign. And the cross was not that to them. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. They loved the esoteric teachers and philosophers and, and ideas. That's what they were impressed by. And the cross was anything but that. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews... A stumbling block means offense, scandal, something they would trip over, and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God's wisdom is so different than ours, and that is pleasing to him as he says, in verse 21, since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. So how can we be in that second group? Those who are being saved for whom the cross is the power of God. Paul answers that question in verses 26 through 29. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called, when they became Christians, in other words. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. That's, that's the, the point. So that he did all this and he used a crucified Messiah, an oxymoron, a laughable thing, so that no one may boast before him. The message of the cross lowers the bar for who can get in, who can get to God, who can be saved, who can know God. And that does two things. It, it makes the, the nobodies of the world important. It gives them a place in God's kingdom. Paul reminds his readers, most of them were not wealthy, important, you know, scholars. <coughs> Excuse me. They heard that Jesus... The Messiah was crucified to take the punishment of their sin and that by trusting in him, they could be forgiven. They could have eternal life. Anyone can understand that. You don't have to have a college degree. You don't even have to know how to read. A child can understand the message of the cross. It is so embarrassingly simple, right? Right? But when the bar is that low, a second thing happens. Old people can only come if they're willing to stoop down under the bar. If they're willing to humble themselves and say, Lord, I, I can't figure it out. My wisdom means nothing. My status means nothing. My knowledge, my goodness, all of those things are empty. The only way to know the power of God at the cross is to humble yourself and boast in the Lord. 
Look at what he says in verses 30 to 31. It is because of him, that is God, God's work, that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. People who humble themselves, you know, there are those who can't humble themselves who say, well, I, I don't believe that, that God would would ever do that. Or I don't believe that I'm that bad that I needed Jesus to die for me. Or uh, that doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't fit what I was expecting. Pride keeps them out. Those, those who are willing to humble themselves and say, they say, wow, God, you're amazing. I never could have dreamed of such a plan. Right? All the credit goes to you. That's what it means to boast in the Lord. To come with empty hands and say, Lord, you have done an amazing work to save me. I didn't do anything to save myself. I didn't think my way there. I didn't, I didn't um, do good works my way there. I didn't, I, I, I didn't learn my way into the kingdom. Jesus saved me. They gladly repent of their sins. They gladly lay down their pride and for them, the message of the cross is power. Because Paul says that Jesus becomes our righteousness, which means we're made right with God. Our holiness, which means he changes our character, power to change us. And our redemption, which means he has taken us from death and brought us into life. All the things that human wisdom thinks it can do but can't, the cross can do. That's how we know its power. So, do you know the power of the cross? Do you know the power of Christ? Some of you um, may have been confused about the cross for years or whatever. Maybe it never quite made sense to you. For some of you, um, maybe you believe that it happened and you you know it's part of the story, but it's just one part of the Bible, and, you know, it's too bad we have to talk about this thing that's so gruesome and ugly. Why can't we just focus on the nice parts of the Bible and the good teachings about love and, and about being a good person? But <laughs> the message of the cross is the center of the Bible. If you lose that, we have nothing left. That is where the power of God is shown in our lives. Do you know that power? Let me close with a story. Um, my wife, Meg, grew up in a small church in New York, and as she remem remembers it, um, the cross never really made sense to her as, as a kid growing up. Uh, in Sunday school, they talked a lot about different Bible stories, you know, Daniel in the lion's den, Moses, uh, Noah and the ark. Maybe... Maybe Jesus on the cross one time a year at Easter. Um, but it was just another story among many in the Bible. She eagerly believed what she was taught. As she grew up, she went to youth groups. She read her Bible. She tried to please God. She tried to be a good person. And God, God was at work in her. But she got through high school without really... Uh, w with the cross being a riddle that she hadn't figured out. Well, somewhere during her first year of college, two things happened, began to happen. First, uh, she went on a summer mission trip with a group of college students and did some intensive Bible studies with them, looking at passages kind of like this one that talk about what happened on the cross? Why did Jesus die for us? Why did he have to die for us? What is sin? How can we be made right with God? And at the same time, life was humbling her. because She had grown up as a big fish in a small pond in a small town in New York. And she got to college where she was a, an average fish in a very big pond with a lot of very smart people. And she dealt with some uh, personal struggles that really 
um, really made her feel at her wit's end. And so as the cross was coming into focus, her sin, her need, her weakness was also coming into focus. And that's when she began to, as Paul says, boast in the Lord. Instead of thinking, I'm a pretty good person. Thank you, God, that I'm such a good person. She started thinking, thank you, Jesus, that you are such a good Savior. Thank you that you died for me. Thank you that you did it in a way I never could have expected. You see, we need a crucified Savior. The cross shows us how desperately we need forgiveness and rescue from death, and it also shows us how unfathomable God's love is for us. Jesus, the Bible says, God was in Christ on that cross, reconciling the world to himself. That means when we see Jesus dying on the cross in humiliation and defeat, we are seeing the reality that God himself dies for his enemies. That's how much he loves us. He died to redeem us. And so have you understood that? Do you count on your own wisdom, your own intelligence, your own smarts, your own power, your own resume, your own religious activities? Or do you say, Jesus, none of that matters. All that matters is you died for me and you love me. And that's my boast. That's the best news I've ever heard. That's what I'm going to live my life on and talk about for the rest of my life. Amen. Well, we have a uh, multi-sensory way this morning to remember what Jesus did on the cross. It's called the Lord's Supper or Communion. Uh, this is open to anyone here today who has faith in Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter if you are, if you're from this church or not, or even from this denomination or not. If you love Jesus and follow Him and trust Him for your forgiveness, um, that's what this is for. Um, at the same time, <coughs> excuse me, this can also be the first step of trusting Jesus. So maybe there's some of you here today who've never really understood it, and now you're hearing Jesus um, uh, speak to you and say, you know, I died for you, and I love you. And even if you've never understood that before and understand it today, you can receive the bread and the juice as a way of responding to Jesus' invitation to you. Because this is all about remembering and proclaiming um, what Jesus did by dying on the cross. Um, I'll invite the deacons forward who are helping serve today. And um, in a moment, I'll, I'll pray over these elements and they'll be distributed to you. Um, so if you are a follower of Jesus, please... Uh, please partake of this. It doesn't matter if you have had a bad week, if you've sinned recently. It's not about your worthiness. It's about what Jesus did. It's about his sacrifice for you. And I would say if you've been struggling to be, quote, a good person, this is something all the more that you need to do. Come and sit and surrender to Jesus and, and receive the bread and the juice in memory of him. Uh, there are gluten-free wafers in these cups. These cups just have juice, and the bread will be distributed separately on trays. But if you need a gluten-free wafer, take one of these cups, which has both the wafer and the juice. And I'll put one of those with each. Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would make 
vivid to our imaginations and our senses the meaning of the cross now. As we um, take into our bodies the symbols of your body and blood uh, broken and poured out for us, I pray that new understanding would be sparked, that faith would grow, that repentance would, uh, would flow from us, and uh, that you, through your Holy Spirit, would continue changing us into your image, giving us righteousness, holiness, and redemption. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, which we remember this Thursday night, his last supper with his disciples, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. So the bread will be distributed and then we'll eat, we'll eat together once it's all been handed out and then we'll do the same with the juice. This is the body of Christ, God's self, given for you. A 
After supper, Jesus took a cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. I couldn't think of a better way to um, wrap up this morning than to sing. A uh, hymn that many of you know and love well, The Old Rugged Cross. Let's sing three verses of this song uh, with thanksgiving for what God has done. Would you stand as we sing? <laughs>
thank you for being with us this morning, everyone. Please stay, if you can, for some coffee and snacks in that room over there. And I uh, hope to see some of you or many of you for some of the Holy Week activities we're having. Uh, but receive the benediction. May you go with the grace and power of the Lord who gave his life up for you to show you his love and to give you redemption. Go in peace. Thank mm-hmm. you.